The word masterstroke is one that you don't hear all that often. Taken from the idea of the painter's brush, it's defined as a very skillful or opportune act. The starting point is the skill, the ability to produce something technically brilliant. But many people have this sort of technical capability, but will never be able to produce their own masterstrokes. It's the opportune part that really defines the masterstroke. It's about knowing the exact moment or circumstance to deploy your skill. It's the extra brushstroke in exactly the right place on the canvas. It's the final note in a chorus at exactly the right moment. It's the ability to see the opening in the opposition line and push through it where so few others could have seen what you saw or had enough faith in themselves to commit to it. Technical skill is easy. The wisdom to know when to use it is what makes the masterstroke the masterstroke. In gaming, we don't see this very often. We see plenty of masterpieces, games that are wholly wonderful and groundbreaking that not only change genres, but change lives. But rarely do we see in games the sort of restraint that makes the masterstroke possible. And that's because most games are deliberately front-loaded. They show off their best parts in the opening hours of the game because developers are desperate to engage and captivate their audiences. They want an audience to play the game in those opening hours and feel good about that purchase so that those people will continue to play and hopefully even share their love of the game with their friends. Of course, many games do crescendo, particularly story-driven games. They build and build to a point where something incredible happens, and maybe we knew it was coming all along, and maybe we didn't, but it still leaves an impact on us. The reveal that I am Darth Revan in KOTOR was one of the best laid plot traps in the history of video games, and it still stays with me to this day. But a crescendo isn't a masterstroke. When we play a story game, we know the story will evolve as we continue through it. Twists and turns are par for course with a story game, and no matter how wonderful they can be, a part of us isn't all that shocked when we learn that Sheik was Princess Zelda all along because of course she was. You want to know what a masterstroke is? This is a masterstroke. Oh man. Wow. Look at those things. So, is everything you were hoping for? It's ups and downs, but you can't deny the view, though. The Last of Us is one of the most cherished narrative gaming masterpieces ever made. But if you ask anyone who loves this game what their favorite part of it was, they'll almost always say this incredible moment when Joel and Ellie step out onto that rooftop and look down into the beautiful untouched landscape below and see the majestic giraffes just grazing peacefully as though the whole chaos you fought through over the preceding 12 to 15 hours didn't exist at all. The Last of Us is a gaming masterpiece. But it's this moment right here that is its masterstroke. It serves no specific purpose or plot tool. This moment doesn't advance the story or get us closer to our goal. It just sits there, alone and unique on the broader canvas of the game. A moment when the developers just leaned in with furrowed brow and made one little unexpected touch that was so brilliant and so masterful and so perfectly timed that it became the defining moment in a game full of defining moments. And the fact that we'd worked so hard for so long to earn this was perhaps its defining achievement. The moment's pause we're granted here prompts us to reflect on everything it took us to get to this moment. And this moment would have been far, far less impactful or even meaningless if it was delivered in the first one or two hours of the game. I recently started playing a game called Warframe, a sci-fi looter action game from Digital Extremes, and I reviewed that game a few weeks back because I was so taken with it after my first 70 or so hours that I felt I just had to share what a remarkable game this had become over the four years since its release. At the time of reviewing, I was firmly of a view that while I was certain the game would have plenty more surprises in store for me, I'd largely seen the best it had to offer, and I was largely expecting more the same. I gotta tell you, I was completely wrong about that. Let me explain. 
The moment I started talking about Warframe on Twitter and YouTube, I kept being asked one question over and over again. I couldn't log into any of my accounts without being spammed this question left, right and center. And this question was, have you done the second dream yet? For those that don't know, Warframe is a looter game that also has a number of quests available as part of the meta progression path. Play for long enough and you'll unlock more and more quests, including a quest called The Second Dream, and one that unlocks soon after that called The War Within. But having done about 5 or 6 quests in my first 70 hours, I was fairly sure that what would come next would be something similar to what I'd seen before, but perhaps with a slightly flashier coat of paint given how excited people were when they talked about it. And I think a lot of this belief is informed by just how far into the game the second dream quest is. I played for literally 150 hours before I progressed far enough to be able to unlock this elusive second dream quest. And I know many others that have played for 300 hours or more and still haven't unlocked it. My thinking was there was no way this quest could be as good as everyone says because if it was, the developers would have made it available to me far earlier because that's what most developers do. They give you most of the best stuff at the beginning in order to hook you in. Now I'm not going to spoil the events of that quest because frankly the quest is so remarkable and so satisfying and so revelatory that if I was to spoil it here for even a single person I'd be disappointed in myself. And I think it's a sentiment shared by the community as well because of the thousands of tweets and comments I received about the game since I started talking about it, not a single person tried to spoil the events of the second dream quest. Every single person without exception respected what that quest is and what it means to the the game and to the people who play it, and that's a pretty rare thing in this age of spoilers. So while I won't share the detail of this quest, I can say this, it changes everything. It's the biggest story bombshell you could imagine, it's cinematic and epic in a way that no other quest to that point is, it's beautifully scored by one of the most powerful pieces of video game music I have ever heard, it deepens the game's lore through both revelatory exposition and posing new questions to ponder, and it meaningfully expands on core game mechanics and progression in a way that no one would have expected. In short, the quest is absolutely the full package and everything everyone says it is, and it was one of the best questing experiences I've ever had in video games. But a good quest does not a masterstroke make. The technical execution of this quest is special in and of itself, but it isn't the reason that I'm making this video today. What makes the second dream and the war within quests masterstrokes is Digital Extreme's decision to gate them behind at least 100 hours or more of content. When I first completed the quest on stream, I remarked that I couldn't believe that I had to wait 150 hours to experience something this great. And many people thought that I was actually complaining about this, but I wasn't. I was in fact just stunned that the developer had shown this sort of restraint and bravery to hold back this experience and deliver it to only those who worked for it. Because much like Joel and Ellie on that rooftop, it was the journey to this point that makes this quest as profound as it is. And to be clear, Digital Extremes didn't need to go this way. Longtime Warframe fans had to wait two years for this quest to arrive because it literally wasn't in the game before that point, but DE could have slotted it into the first 10 or so hours when it was released to really showcase how incredible the lore and character and world building and quest design is to new players just beginning the game. This is what I think most developers would have done lesser developers, with less vision for their work, and with less belief in the brilliance of that work. DE didn't do this. They held this experience back so that new players would have to work for it, and their restraint here is their masterstroke. Few developers would have had the courage to do what DE did here, and more than anything else, it folds into the broader narrative of Warframe being a game for grown-ups. One that asks you to wade through the complexity of its game systems to reach a satisfying depth of understanding so rare in other video games, and one that asks for your patience as it slowly leads you towards moments that would be nowhere near as satisfying had they just been handed to you in the game's opening acts. DE did something really special here. 
But believe it or not, there's even more about Dee's approach to quests that has surprised and frankly inspired me, but that's a topic for another video. For now, I simply want to say that Warframe may appear at face value to be a mindless, grindy action game, but if you stick with it and pay attention to what it's doing and saying, you'll find it's simultaneously one of the bravest and most interesting games on the market today. And I hope this video gives people the added boost they might need to push through that initial grindy barrier, because I can promise you that what's waiting for you on the other side is worth every second you've invested to get to that point.